The Head Gardener's Story by Anton Chekhov Translated by Constance Garnett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Alan Davis Drake The Head Gardener's Story A sale of flowers was taking place at Count N.'s greenhouses. The purchasers were few in number. A landowner who was a neighbor of mine, a young timber merchant, and myself. While the workmen were carrying out our magnificent purchases and packing them into carts, we sat at the entry of the greenhouse and chatted about one thing or another. It was extremely pleasant to sit in a garden on a still April morning listening to birds and watching the flowers brought out into the open air and basking in the sunshine the head gardener mikhail karlovitch a venerable old man with a full-shaven face wearing a fur waistcoat and no coat superintended the packing of the plants himself but at the same time he listened to our conversation in the hope of hearing something new he was an intelligent very good-hearted man respected by everyone. He was, for some reason, looked upon by everyone as a German, though in reality on his father's side Swedish, on his mother's side Russian, and attended the Orthodox Church. He knew Russian, Swedish, and German. He had read a good deal in those languages, and nothing one could do gave him greater pleasure than lending him some new book or talking to him, for instance, about Ibsen. He had his weaknesses, but they were innocent ones. He called himself the head gardener, though there were no undergardeners. The expression of his face was usually dignified and haughty. He could not endure to be contradicted, and liked to be listened to with respect and attention. That young fellow there I can recommend to you as an awful rascal said my neighbor, pointing to a laborer with a swarthy gypsy face, who drove by with a water-barrel. Last week he was tried in town for burglary and was acquitted. They pronounced him mentally deranged, and yet look at him. He is the picture of health. Scoundrels are very often acquitted nowadays in Russia on grounds of abnormality and aberration. Yet these acquittals, these unmistakable proofs of an indulgent attitude to crime lead to no good they demoralize the masses the sense of justice is blunted in all as they become accustomed to seeing vice unpunished and you know in our age one might boldly say in the words of shakespeare that in our evil and corrupt age virtue must ask forgiveness of vice that is very true, the merchant assented. Owing to these frequent acquittals, murder and arson have become much more common. Ask the peasants. Mikhail Karlovich turned towards us and said, As far as I am concerned, gentlemen, I am always delighted to meet with these verdicts of not guilty. I am not afraid for morality and justice when they say not guilty. But on the contrary, I feel pleased. Even when my conscience tells me the jury have made a mistake in acquitting the criminal, even then I am triumphant. Judge for yourselves, gentlemen. If the judges and the jury have more faith in man than in evidence, material proofs and speeches for the prosecution, is not that faith in man in itself higher than any ordinary considerations. Such faith is only attainable by those few who understand and feel Christ. A fine thought, I said, but not a new one. I remember a very long time ago I heard a legend on that subject, a very charming legend, said the gardener, and he smiled. I was told it by my grandmother my father's mother, an excellent old lady. 
She told me it in Swedish, and it does not sound so fine, so classic in Russian. But we begged him to tell it, and not to be put off by the coarseness of the Russian language. Much gratified, he deliberately lighted his pipe, looked angrily at the laborers, and began. There settled in a certain little town a solitary plain elderly gentleman called Thompson, or Wilson. But that does not matter. The surname is not the point. He followed an honorable profession. He was a doctor. He was always morose and unsociable, and only spoke when required by his profession. He never visited anyone, never extended his acquaintance beyond a silent bow, and lived as humble as a hermit. The fact was, he was a learned man, and in those days learned men were not like other people. They spent their days and nights in contemplation in reading and in healing disease, looked upon everything else as trivial, and had no time to waste a word. The inhabitants of the town understood this, and tried not to worry him with their visits and empty chatter. They were very glad that God had sent them at last a man who could heal disease, and were proud that such a remarkable man was living in their town. He knows everything they said about him. But that wasn't enough. They ought to have also said, He loves everyone. In the breast of that learned man there beat a wonderful angelic heart. Though the people of that town were strangers and not his own people, yet he loved them like children, and did not spare himself for them. He was himself ill with consumption, and had a cough. But when he was summoned to the sick, he forgot his own illness. He did not spare himself, and, gasping for breath, climbed up the hills, however high they might be. He disregarded the sultry heat and the cold, despised thirst and hunger. He would accept no money, and, strange to say, when one of his patients died, he would follow the coffin with the relations, weeping. And soon he became so necessary to the town, that the inhabitants wondered how they could have got on before, without the man. Their gratitude knew no bounds. Grown-up people and children, good and bad alike, honest men and cheats, all, in fact, respected him and knew his value. In the little town and all the surrounding neighborhood, there was no man who would allow himself to do anything disagreeable to him. Indeed, they would never have dreamed of it. When he came out of his lodgings, he never fastened the doors or windows, in complete confidence that there was no thief who could bring himself to do him wrong. He often had, in the course of his medical duties, to walk along the high roads, through the forests and mountains, haunted by numbers of hungry vagrants. But he felt that he was in perfect security. One night he was returning from a patient when robbers fell upon him in the forest. But when they recognized him, they took off their hats respectfully and offered him something to eat. When he answered that he was not hungry, they gave him a warm wrap and accompanied him as far as the town, happy that fate had given them the chance in some small way to show their gratitude to the benevolent man. Well, to be sure, my grandmother told me that even the horses and the cows and the dogs knew him and expressed their joy when they met him. And this man, who seemed by his sanctity to have guarded himself from every evil, to whom even brigands and frenzied men wished nothing but good, was one fine morning found murdered. Covered with blood, with his skull broken, he was lying in a ravine and his pale face wore an expression of amazement. Yes, not horror, but amazement was the emotion that had been fixed upon his face when he saw the murderer before him. You can imagine the grief that overwhelmed the inhabitants of the town and the surrounding districts. All were in despair, unable to believe their eyes, 
wondering who could have killed the man. The judges who conducted the inquiry and examined the doctor's body said, Here we have all the signs of a murder, but as there is not a man in the world capable of murdering our doctor, obviously it was not a case of murder, and the combination of evidence is due to simple cause. We must suppose that in the darkness he fell into the ravine of himself and was mortally injured. The whole town agreed with this opinion. The doctor was buried, and nothing more was said about a violent death. The existence of a man who could have the baseness and wickedness to kill the doctor seemed incredible. There is a limit even to wickedness, isn't there? All at once, would you believe it, chance led them to discover the murderer, a vagrant who had been many times convicted, notorious for his vicious life, was seen selling for a drink a snuff-box and watch that had belonged to the doctor. When he was questioned he was confused, and answered with an obvious lie. A search was made, and in his bed was found a shirt with stains of blood on the sleeves and a doctor's lancet set in gold. What more evidence was wanted? They put the criminal in prison. The inhabitants were indignant, and at the same time said, It's incredible. It can't be so. Take care that a mistake is not made. It does not happen, you know. That evidence tells a false tale. At his trial the murderer obstinately denied his guilt. Everything was against him and to be convinced of his guilt was as easy as to believe that this earth is black. But the judges seemed to have gone mad. They weighed every proof ten times, looked distrustfully at the witnesses, flushed crimson, and sipped water. The trial began early in the morning, and was only finished in the evening. The chief judge said, addressing the murderer, the court has found you guilty of murdering Dr. So-and-so, and has sentenced you to— The chief judge meant to say, to the death penalty, but he dropped from his hands the paper on which the sentence was written, wiped the cold sweat from his face, and cried out, No! May God punish me if I judged wrongly, but I swear he is not guilty. I cannot admit the thought that there exists a man who would dare to murder our friend the doctor. A man could not sink so low. There cannot be such a man, the other judges assented. No, the crowd cried. Let him go. The murderer was set free to go where he chose, and not one soul blamed the court for an unjust verdict. And my grandmother used to say, that for such faith in humanity God forgave the sins of all the inhabitants of that town. He rejoices when people believe that man in his image and semblance, and grieves if, forgetful of human dignity, they judge worse of men than dogs. The sentence of acquittal may bring harm to the inhabitants of the town, but on the other hand, think of the beneficial influence upon them, of that faith in man, a faith which does not remain dead. You know, it raises up generous feelings in us and always impels us to love and respect every man, every man, and that is important. Mikhail Karlovich had finished. My neighbor would have urged some objection but the head gardener made a gesture that signified that he did not like objections. Then he walked away to the carts, and, with an expression of dignity, went on looking after the packing. End of The Head Gardener's Story by Anton Chekhov This recording is in the public domain.